Are these all your lunches? You mean you eat other people's lunches? Stop it! Now we are going to do something extremely fun. We're going to play a wonderful game called Who is my daddy and what does he do? Yes? Is your daddy a fireman? He's probably big. Is he a wrestler? Is he a basketball coach? No, 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 no. What's the matter? Oh, I have a headache. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor at all. What I meant was, you tell me, who is your daddy and what does he do? Oh. That's how I feel like sometimes, you know? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> wow. Let me just welcome you to Grace Life here at the El Paso campus. Those of you who are live here this morning, really good to have you with us, as well as all of you who are joining us online uh, all over the United States, as well as, man, I mean all over the world, literally. Uh, lot of, lots and lots of different places throughout the world, uh, including, well, we had uh, Japan and China and Germany and uh, Kuwait and uh, you name it. That's all over the world, people watching this. So we're just glad to have you with us today. Uh, today we're going to continue in our series uh, by looking at our series called uh, The Abundant Life. And what we're going to be doing is looking at some things today that are really interesting as far as your life is concerned, or my life is concerned. In other words, how we can literally experience life change within our lives that we because a lot of us are looking for that in a way that probably is beyond human comprehension. As a matter of fact, uh, what we're going to be talking about in the next uh, couple of weeks or so, because we're looking at the other side of that life diagram you'll see here in a minute, is uh, totally opposed to, to the world's way of thinking, uh, including the religious world, quite honestly. It's just totally opposed to what our world is, what well our religious world believes and thinks about the Bible and about God. And uh, most people consider it to be just absolute utter foolishness. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul talks about that same fact over in, uh, in the Corinthians when he says, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now that's kind of interesting. I think it's an interesting statement that he makes there, that uh, the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Uh, I think, in, well, in another place he call, kind of calls preachers uh, sort of foolish too, doesn't he? says not many wise and not many noble were called to preach the gospel. So, you know, well, I guess I fit in that category pretty good. What we're going to be talking about is the fact that when you realize that your true identity is found only in Jesus Christ, it will literally change your life from the inside out. Now, identity is an important issue. Uh, and that's why we're going to be talking about that today. As a matter of fact, not only will it help us understand what it, what it means to be in Christ, and it will give you the confidence and the freedom to not only be who you are, because that's really what's important here, isn't it? Is being who you are. All of us want to be who we are. Right? We don't want to be somebody else. Well, we want to be somebody else, but we can't. You know, sometimes we try to be somebody else. I always get a kick out of, I think I mentioned that a week or two ago, about the kids that come a lot of times that have their, you know, Superman outfit on or those kind of things, Batman outfit, those kind of things are really cute. Well, you know, we still do that as adults. We still try to a lot of times be somebody who we're not. And yet when it comes right down to it, the only thing we want to do is just simply be who we are as an individual. And, uh, but, but knowing these things, the things that we're going to be talking about, will also free us from the fears and the worries that, consume our lives and really keep us from enjoying life uh, because we all have fears and those kind of things and worries that consume us on a day-to-day -day basis and, and they need not be there they don't need to be there and if we understand who we are in Christ if we understand our identity in Christ then those things will go away so let's be, begin by asking the question that you're probably already asking yourself well what does it mean then to be in Christ what does that mean um, and, and how will that help me to be a better person in this world today? Uh, you know, we, we use, a lot of times we use um, religious language, right? I mean, I try not to do that uh, because, uh, hey, I, a lot of that religious language I don't understand all that well either. Uh, I mean, I've had to study it real careful and, uh, you know, figure out what it's talking about. But, you know what, we use religious language sometimes and we, and we all nod our heads like we understand what we're saying and yet... Uh, deep down inside we're going, what does that mean? You know, really, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean then to be in Christ? To be in Christ. 
Uh, I think you remember that on the opposite side of the picture, on the opposite side of that life diagram that we've been looking at, whenever we choose to find our identity in the world, our search will never end. Uh, because there is an, there, there's, no, there's no end to the identities that you could have or you could, to, to, could try to be. Simply because the choices of deciding who I am are always changing and totally uh, deceptive. Our world is not real uh, in that sense of the word. Uh, not only that, but the possibilities are literally endless. So today I'm going to, uh, you know, what it looks like in, as far as that is concerned, if we find our identity in the world, is that, well, today I'm a businessman, you know, uh, an important business executive, and tomorrow I'm a janitor because, you know, my company went under, right? So your identity changes, and sometimes that can throw you for a complete loop. Uh, you know, today I'm a, I'm a handsome young dude, and tomorrow I'm a wrinkled old man. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> you know? Uh, today my family loves me, tomorrow I'm, an, I'm a man without a family, right? You know, today I'm a, I have a mom, tomorrow I have three stepmoms, and the one I'm calling dad isn't my real dad, right? All those different kind of things. Today I'm pastor of a thriving church, tomorrow I'm flip, flipping hamburgers at Mickey D's. Uh, you know, if, you, if that's where your identity is, then we've got a problem. You know, because your identity will always change if you find your identity in the world and those kind of things. So however, on the other side of that picture and on the other side of your life diagram, if you've been keeping up with that, you've probably already filled in the box that says, in Christ, right? Uh, hopefully you've already filled in that box that says, in Christ. And if you need one of those, there should be one or two out there, on the, right out there in front of the barn and coffee saloon. And so what I want you to notice at this point is that there are several little boxes underneath where it says in Christ. There's several little boxes there, one, two, three, uh, four, five boxes there. And, um, because, and the reason for that is, is because there are a lot of different identities, a lot of different aspects of our identity in Christ. So um, even though the possibilities of who we might be in the world are totally endless, endless as far as our identity is concerned, what I want you to understand here is that there's that in Christ there is only one identity. It's in Christ. Why? Because He is the only one he, who created you. He's the one who created you. And He is the only one who knows who you are. Since He is the one who created you, then He is the only one who knows who you are. So when we realize that our true identity can only be found in Jesus Christ, and it's simply a matter of discovering what that means to us as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. And the fact is there are many different and really awesome aspects uh, which our identity in Christ includes. Notice carefully that I didn't say that in Christ we have a lot of different identities. That's not what we have. We can have a lot of different identities. As a matter of fact, in the world, as far as the world is concerned, all of us have a different identity, right? Uh, you work at one job, I work at a different job. We, you like, you, you're interested in one thing, I'm interested in another thing. All those different kind of things. So in, 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 on this level, on the worldly level, we all have a lot of different identities, and we identify ourselves by a lot of different things. But, but in Christ, they're, they're, uh, we only have a single identity, and that is in Him. So today what I want to do talk to, is talk with you a few minutes about a few different aspects or characteristics or facets, maybe, of our identity in Christ. Okay? Because there's a lot of different characteristics or aspects or, or however you want to say that in Christ. So the first box I want you to fill in today, or at least uh, the first thing I want you to do uh, under that in Christ uh, is I want you to put in the words there where it says, uh, in Christ, aspects of my identity. Write that in between in Christ and the those little boxes. Write aspects of my identity. Because in the world what we looked at were a lot of different identities, but in Christ there are aspects of my identity. A single identity in Christ but there are a lot of different aspects of that identity. And the first box there, what I want you to do is put in there, His child. His child, because we hear a lot of that talked about today as far as in religious circles about being a child of God, right? We, we hear that, we talk about that, we hear people say it a lot of times, are you a child of God? Well, yes or no, or whatever the case might be. And I guess that seems simple enough to say that I am a child of God. 
Because the Bible tells us directly in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, but it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, even though to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right? Um, in, in the simplest of terms, then, that saying that you become a child of God by believing in Jesus Christ. In other words, in the, in the second verse, there, the next verse is that, that you can't be born into, uh, just because your, your family is, happens to be Christian or you're born into a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian, right? So it's not by flesh and blood. It's not because you're born, uh, uh, you know, uh, into that thing, you know, in that sense of the word. Like a lot of people, you know, a lot of us maybe uh, identify ourselves by a particular religion or denomination. Maybe I should say it that way. We maybe, you know, we were born into a particular denomination, so we just consider ourselves to be that denomination. Uh, but that doesn't work that way when it comes to becoming a child of God. You can't become a child of God because you're Christian, your, your parents were Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Just because your parents believed in Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you're going to believe in Jesus Christ. I think we, like, we would like to believe that our children do or will at some point in time in their life, but that isn't always the case. You, know, you can raise them as good as you can and they still are going to make their own decisions in life and that's because they're an individual. And part of the problem is, is they need to understand who they are in Christ, not uh, who they are within your family or within that denomination or whatever the case might be. So his child in the simplest of terms means that at that specific point in time at which you uh, put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you became at that moment a child of God. In the simplest of terms, that's really what that's talking about, right? Become a child of God means that when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you become a believer, a born-again believer, when you become a Christian, you are a child of God at that particular moment in time. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. That's absolutely. That's true. That's a fact. And how awesome is that, right? That, that's, a, that's an awesome thing to know, is that when you become a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. A child of God. How I want you to know at this point is that there is much more to being a child of God than simply knowing that you're on your way to heaven. Because that is the most basic understanding of becoming a child of God, right? Is that when you become a child of God, then you're on your way to heaven. And really, that's really where uh, most of us and most religions begin and end. Is they say, okay, you're a child of God. Well, that's great. That means you're going to heaven. Cool. You know, that's because you're a child of God. You're going to heaven. So even though I'm not going to, I don't intend to spend a lot of time, a lot of extra time on this particular idea or thing. I, I just want to say that, you know, Satan wants us to believe that we are still sinners though even as a child of God Satan wants us to believe that we are still sinners because uh, oh, saved sinners yes and religion teaches us that right go, go to any church they'll tell you that you're you're a sinner saved by and a lot of us identify ourselves that way I'm a sinner saved by grace well but we're still sinners in other words uh, religion always teaches us that you're simply a sinner saved by grace. Well, the emphasis there is on the sinner, not the saved by grace, really, in my opinion. And, and if that's the case, and we're still sinners, we've still got a problem. Meaning that even though you are now a full-fledged member of God's family by grace through faith, you're still a sinner. Okay. i got to tell you, though, that's not what the Bible says. I didn't say that we don't still sin, did I? I didn't say that. I didn't say that, we're, that we don't still have sin in our lives and we don't still do things wrong. But if we identify ourselves by that, then that's what, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to fall on that side of the picture. Right? So in other words, we're not... Let's, let's, let's look at what the Bible says. Let's look, look at what the Bible says about this idea. Paul gives us a, an everyday illustration in Romans chapter 7 to make sure that we understand that we are not sinners, still sinners, saved by grace. You can't be on both sides of that fence at the same time. As a matter of fact, you're on either side and only on one side or the other. Uh, you're either a born-again believer in Jesus Christ or you're still a sinner, one or the other. Uh, so let's look at that, uh, see what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 7, Paul begins and he says, Or do you not know, brethren, 
if I'm speaking to those of you who know the law, okay, so here's our first clue. We're going to be talking about the law, right? Old Testament law. That the law says, the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Okay, got it so far? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while, she, while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, okay, here's the illustration. That was a previous illustration. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she will not be an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Okay, now hold on a minute because he's, what's he talking about here? Marriage? Yes. Yeah, his illustration is about marriage, right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, he's speaking specifically about what the Old Testament law has to say about marriage. Old Testament law, remember, because Christ has already taken care of the law. It's, that's not even applicable today, all right? So what the Old Testament law says about divorce and adultery, and according to Old Testament, there's only one specific instance, one particular case in which a woman can remarry without being labeled an adulteress. I didn't say she was an adulteress, and I don't think it says it there either. It says labeled as an adulteress, right? <laughs> Called an adulteress. Well, when is that? When, when is it when a woman, can, in the Old Testament talking about, if a woman remarried, uh, when was she called? When, when is the only instance in which she would not be called an adulteress? The only instance is when, when she would not be called an adulteress. When is that? If her husband's dead, right? According to Old Testament law, if her husband the only time, the only time in which she would not be called then an adulteress if she remarries. Only if her first husband is dead. I, I always get a kick out of, uh, I think you've probably heard that before, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, somebody asked her one time if she ever thought about divorce, and she said, you know, she said over 35 years of marriage, she said, I've never thought about divorce. Murder, yes. Divorce, never. <laughs> I think a lot of us could probably relate to that. <laughs> um, so the only case in which a woman could remarry, according to Old Testament law, was if her husband was dead. Okay, so Paul goes on to say then in verse 4, Therefore, okay, he gave the illustration of a woman who, uh, if, she was, if she was going to remarry, we got that, got that in your mind. Therefore, he says, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Here's the illustration. In order for you to be able to remarry, if you, let's all consider ourselves to be women. Well, maybe not. But anyway, uh, however you want to say that, um, Mary, uh, according to the Old Testament law, your old husband had to be dead. First husband had to be dead. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Okay, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, he says, you also have died to the law. Well, what law is he talking about here? What law are we made to die to? Well, specifically the law of sin and of death. Specifically that law. The law that says the wages of sin is death. He says, you're dead to that law. That law no longer applies. That's the point. The law of sin and of death no longer applies because of what Jesus has done. And that's exactly why Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has, and I'm going to say made, because I, I think it makes a difference in that. I think what the original Greek literally means is made you free from the law of sin and of death. The reason I say made, because a lot of people don't understand that we're already free. We're already free from the law of sin and of death. Right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It, there's that phrase, in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Here's the, here's the law that trumps the other two. 
This law, the law of life in Christ Jesus, has made you free from the law of sin and of death. Right? The law of sin is that all sin. The law of death is that we all deserve death because of our sin. There's no doubt about that. However, the law that trumps both of those is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is what we have when we come, become His child. When we become a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, we, that law now is alive within our lives. We have died to the law of sin and of death, so that it no longer has any power, any authority over us. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. He says, And He Himself, who is He Himself? Jesus. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin. Okay, so how can we be a sinner saved by grace if we've already died to sin through the body of Jesus Christ? Can't happen. And so therefore He says... You're not an, you can't be called an adulteress, <laughs> you know, you're married to two, you know, you're still married to two people at the same time. Because you've made, made to die to the law through the body of Christ and made alive in Him, right? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by His wounds you were healed. So if we have died to that law of sin and of death, the law, through the body of Jesus Christ, if we are dead to that, then we are free to remarry or to become a child of God or to be connected with Him and part of His family. No longer are we sinners saved by grace. We are children of God. We, are, we belong to Him and we can't be called adulterers because we're no longer sinners in that sense of the word. Because we've died to that within our lives through the body of Jesus Christ. So that we are in Him, we are His child. Right? We're His child. Uh, oh, let me, uh, this is extra, won't cost you nothing. Uh, healed of what? He says, by His, it says, by His wound we are healed. I hear a lot about that in, in these days and in, in years past. You probably all, you've heard that as well. By his wounds we are healed. Well, which wounds did he say that we are healed from? Well, not our physical ailments. He didn't say that. He said we're not healed of, of ever having headaches again or ever having another sinus infection or healed from having bad knees or polio or bad back or whatever the case might be. He says that we are healed of our sins, healed of our unrighteousness. That through the body of Jesus Christ, we've been healed of those things. We have died to sin and become alive to God in Jesus Christ. So we have, that's what He's healed us from, is that all those sins and all those things that used to take place in our lives. So we're no longer sinners saved by grace. We are His child, born of Him. And we are righteous because He is righteous. It's His righteousness in us that makes us righteous, not our own. Meaning that sin is no longer the problem, either in salvation or in our lives after we are saved. Neither way. Sins are no longer the problem. We are not sinners saved by grace. Sins are not the problem. Because you are now a child of God who himself is sinless. And he is our righteousness because we are in him and he is in us. So don't call yourself a sinner saved by grace because you're not. You can't be on both sides of that fence at the same time. And if you're a child of God, you're a child of God, period. That's where that's at. You've been made to die to the law through the body of Christ and made alive together with Him in Jesus Christ. So that now you're simply a child of God because you're now a child of God and as a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you also are sinless or a perfect saint in Him. That's who you are. Okay, so in the next few boxes then in your life diagram, if you're, working, if you're filling that in, you can write words like confident. Put confident in there if you want to. Well, why? Because since I am no longer considered to be a sinner, then what is there to fear from God, right? If Jesus has already taken care of the law of sin and of death, if sins aren't the issue, then what, 
then I can walk out confidently into this world, not afraid of God or anybody else for that matter, because He has already taken care of that. You can also work, write the words no fear if you want to in there. Uh, if He is for us, who can be against us, right? As a child of God, we have all of these things within our lives. As a child of God, no longer are we sinners saved by grace. We are His child. We are saints because of Him. We, don't, we, we can walk out confidently because He is our Father, not Satan, and not sin isn't our Father within our life any longer. We don't have two natures. We don't have an old nature and a new nature. We have flesh, certainly. We have fleshly appetites, but you know what? We are, we are a child of God. We have one nature, and that nature is Jesus Christ within us. You need to understand that. Because any time we try to, to fill in the blank on the other side of that, that's where we're going to end up at. You've got to understand that as a child of God, we can be, we're, we're confident. We can be confident. We get, don't have to fear anything. <laughs> we don't have to fear the law of sin and of death. You don't have to fear that when you sin, God's going to get you, right? But how many believers do you know in our world today who are still afraid of God because they still think that their sins are keeping them separated from God? God says, no. He's already taken care of that issue. Sins are no longer the issue in salvation or in your life after you're saved. Uh, so you can also write in there, completely forgiven. And I do mean completely forgiven. Meaning that you are a saint, literally, in God. You're dead to sin. You can walk in newness of life now. Because the Bible says now in Jesus Christ we walk in newness of life. Not the oldness of the letter. Because he says the letter kills. We all know that. You try to live by the letter of the law, you, you, you quickly find out you can't do it anyhow. So he says, no, don't do that. You've died to those things. You've been made alive to God so that now you can walk in newness of life. Because you're His child. You can have confidence in Him. You're a saint. <laughs> I'm a saint, anyway. Just ask anybody, they'll tell you. Ask my mama, she'll tell you. <laughs> no, you are too. You are too. So, when we realize that our true identity can only be found in Jesus Christ, then all of these different aspects, and there are many, there are many, there are too many to mention, all of these different aspects or characteristics or facets of our identity in Jesus Christ all become ours. And that's where we need to put our attention and our, and our focus. That's why he says, put your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Put your mind on those things that, that are good and righteous and, you know, all those things. That's what you need to be putting your mind on because that's who you are. You no longer are identified by this world. You're identified simply as a child of God. His child. Forgiven. His child. Righteous. A saint. Confident, no worries, no fears. Another thing I want you, the last thing I want you to notice about all of these aspects or characteristics or facets of our identity in Christ is that they all, every single one of them, always builds you up. Doesn't tear you down. Always builds you up, always makes you strong in Him. Why? So that you can literally be a change agent in the building up of the body of Christ. That's why. Not only so who you are as an individual, because God's the one who created you. He knows who you are. And He wants you to be who He has created you to be. He doesn't want you to be somebody else. He doesn't want you to be the, who the preacher says you should be. He wants you to be who you are as His child. And who, has, who he, he has created you to be. And when we do that, when we find our identity in Christ, when we actually act on that identity 
within the body of Christ, not only does it build ourselves up, but we in turn also build up the body of Christ where we're at. So how does all that happen? Well, well here, here's a string of verses. Let me give, give you two or three. For or because of His fullness we have received and grace upon grace. We've received His fullness in our lives. And He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. He is the one who fills us and makes us who we are. For because, or because, in Him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete. All right, that's pretty cool, huh? You have been made complete in Him. You don't lack anything. He's not holding anything back from you. Everything that He has is yours. Why? For the building up, up of yourself. So that you also in turn can build up the body of Christ. And He is the head over all rule and authority. He's in charge here, not us. And when we let Him be in charge of our lives, He not only shows us who we are, but what we are. And that's when we really find out who we are and what we are. And you'll find out who you really are. Yeah. We might try to be a lot of different things. You know, be a good Christian. I, I, I don't know how many years I spent trying to be a good Christian. You know, you can't do that. It's got to be Him living His life through you that causes you to be what He has made you to be. We can try all as hard as we want to, but we can't do that. It's only Him in us that accomplishes that purpose through us. God's awesome. And He wants you to be who He has created you to be. Not somebody else. Don't try to be anybody but who you are. And the way to find out who you are is by surrendering your life to Him. And letting Him show God's awesome. Lord bless you all. Amen. Amen. Good God.